All right, everyone, it's Peter Chadi. Hi, welcome to my webinar about NFT legal issues. We'll have other people joining and then I'll send this around also on demand. So the link will be available as will be the deck, by the way, in case somebody wants a copy of the deck, you can just drop me a note to peter at creativemedia.biz. So I'm gonna start getting into it right away. Uh, and I think that everybody's gonna be able to see it full screen. So this is what we'll do. I have a lot of information to share with you. And so I'm gonna go pretty rapid fire, which will probably take about 45 minutes. And I'm sure many of you will have questions. Um, so look at the Q&A. You can click on the Q&A at the top or bottom, wherever you have your bar or chat. Um, Q&A is probably gonna be easier just to keep tabs of everything. And like I said, I'll also have a recording of this afterwards, but we'll go through pretty rapid fire about the update on business and legal issues. First of all, I do think it's important to give a little bit about my background, just so everybody understands the context of where this is coming from. Um, I am a business person, a serial entrepreneur who's been in major media companies, but also start several startups um, that have achieved exits. But I'm also a lawyer by trade, and I'm a California licensed attorney, graduated from Harvard, was a general counsel of um, uh, one of the major operating divisions of Universal Studios. And I was an IP entertainment lawyer for a number of years in major firms. So my background comes pretty like broad 360 degrees, which I think um, at the risk of sounding a bit self-serving, that's very helpful when it comes to understanding the, the overall legal implications. Anytime you're dealing with a lawyer, it's helpful if they understand business context too. And then in this spe specific context, I work quite deeply in the world of Web3 and NFTs. I'm fortunate to work with some, some leading entrepreneurs, innovators in the overall space. So I learn from them, we collaborate together, we solve problems together. And I talk to a lot of really smart people in the world of NFTs, and that's both entrepreneurs who are minting them, but also to their advisors, their venture capitalists, all of that. So we take our collective learning and that's something that uh, is very helpful. We also leverage each other's resources so we can understand what the best practices are, such as they are in this space, and then go from there. But one thing, just as a little context, I have a link at the bottom of uh, this slide. It was an article that I wrote in Billboard magazine eight years ago now, and I look back at it, and I was talking about community-based business models at the time. So before anybody was talking about Web3, the idea of having art creators and their audience directly connect with one another to finance each other, which is kind of at the, the core of what NFTs are, that is something that's kind of been top of mind for me and I've been very interested in from the very beginning. So that's a little bit about my background. So that's the context of the kind of the advice, also the experience, also the things I'm gonna be identifying, I synthesize for the purposes of this, this webinar. So first of all, Let's talk about context. When you're talking about something like Web3 and NFTs, as we all know, it's emerging. So we're still in the very early, very early days. So in that kind of a context, there are very um, limited, clear rules of the game. In fact, there are virtually no clear rules of the game. And so there's a lot of, emer it, everything's emerging right now. It's a brave new world. So it's still establishing. That means there's a lot of gray. That's why it's very important to work with attorneys and advisors who are deeply involved in this sort of thing to help you give a lay, get a lay of the, the land. Obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty and that leads to and highly competitive nature of this space, which can lead to litigation. And so it's, it's a very challenging space. But again, mitigating your risks, reducing them, understanding what they are is going to be critical. I, I'm a huge believer in Web3 and NFTs, huge believer. The vast majority of things that are out there today, there is a, there's a lot of pump and dump, things like that. But the high level concept of what Web3 is and what NFTs are, which are what we're going to talk about, I'm a huge believer, as, as you can see from my, from my Billboard article from eight years ago. I believe in it. It's global opportunity and it's a massive opportunity. So for anybody, the entrepreneurs who are out there, this is something that you're creating the rules of the game. It's not you know, Fear is not an option if you want to innovate and seize this opportunity. And those of you who are entrepreneurs know that. But it's a question of being smart. 
one high level that's really important when you look at this, especially when we start talking about some of the securities issues out there, every territory and jurisdiction around the world plays by different rules of the game. So contract law, um, regulatory law, securities laws, things like that. There are 200 plus territories in the world. So when you're thinking about your NFT strategy and rollout, how do you address that? I'll talk about how to do that in this borderless world, how best to do it, how I advise my clients about how best to do that. So here's a quick refresher about NFTs. And I know those of you who are watching this, you know this, but I, I think it's important to kind of underscore what the core value proposition is. NFTs give ownership of rights to a unique one-of-a-kind asset that is recorded and authenticated on the blockchain. blockchain. So think of it like a specific concert seat. Um, it is a non-fungible token. So every seat in a stadium is going to be different than the other seat. It's a non-fungible sort of asset. So an NFT, think about an NFT that, that way. Now, NFTs can be digital, digital arts, videos, audio, songs, digital ticketing, and digital ticketing is really interesting. It solves a lot of problems with conventional ticketing. But NFTs can also be used to authenticate physical assets. So I think a lot of people don't understand that NFTs aren't just digital, they're also authenticating physical assets. Some of the companies I work with do that via NFC chips. But think about like art. If you're a painter with a canvas, then uh, in, in the traditional times, how, do you, how can one be sure that something's not forged? Well, NFTs can solve that problem. And then of course, NFTs, and I love this, can provide a full 360 degree experience for the buyer through both the hybrid physical good and then the digital good and tie it together with an experience too that's lasting. Now, that's fascinating. That's an area called fidgetals. I don't know if I love that term, candidly, but it's some, something that some clever person thought of. And so I throw it out there. But that's a really interesting opportunity. I urge you to check out a company called Ood that I'm working with. They just had their first drop. I think it was last week of physical art by a well-known um, artist, a painter, together with a digital like counterpart to it and an overall experience. Check out Ood, O-O-D. I think it's oodapp.com, something like that. Now, when it comes to brands using NFTs, think about a brands out there. As we all know, many are experimenting. Nike is the leading brand. Nike has been very ambitious in this space. They've earned up to this point, as just reported, almost $100 million on NFTs so far, and it's still the early days. So Nike has been the most successful in the NFT market for any fashion brand. So they are a leader worth following in terms of how they're going about it. Here's another interesting company. It's called Cartamundi. It's a company I know. They're out of Europe. You probably don't know the name, but you probably play with their playing cards, the bicycle cards. Well, Cartamundi just, just um, recently inked a partnership with DC Comics out of Warner Media to create these Hero, H-R-O, hybrid trading cards, which give a 360 degree fan experience that unlocks rewards and additional experiences. So for your favorite DC comic character, you get a physical card, you get a digital counterpart to it, and you get an overall experience. So if you're a holder, if you paid for the NFT, you get special benefits that nobody else has. And then I was playing as we were holding some music from Chainsmokers, reason why, although they are fun to see and I've seen them before. So that's reason enough. But nonetheless, the reason why I put it here is that NFTs can also be give fractional ownership and fractional earning to a membership group. And in this case with Chainsmokers, there's a company, the leading company when it comes to fractional buying of music catalog rights. So actual copyrights into um, master recordings or compositions. There's a company called Royal that's, I think, raised well over $50 million now, blue chip investors. And just recently, they, they minted 5,000 tokens and they made them available to fans to actually buy these NFTs, 
So be part owners, fractional owners into the Chainsmakers, Chainsmokers latest music. And interestingly, as part of owning it, that means they get a piece of the earnings, the ongoing royalties for those songs on that album. So now we have fractional ownership where you have a group of fans coming together to support the artist, but also uh, earn from the value that they create in that music. And you can imagine the incentives there from the fans to then really promote this music because ultimately if they promote it to their friends and so on and so on and so on, they're going to be benefiting, benefiting it not only for bragging rights, but also from economics themselves. So that's interesting. Now, when you're talking about that kind of thing, that implicates securities laws. So that was a big mountain for Royal to climb to be able to offer that up in the marketplace. How did they do it? They worked with lawyers who were understanding and really canvassed the space and figured out a solution for that. So again, a legal framework is necessary to be able to navigate these kind of waters. But for anybody who's thinking about that kind of an opportunity to make an, a fractional investment, securities laws following what Royal did is something that's worth knowing. Now, ultimately, think of NFTs as your golden ticket, your access card into a membership with privileges. So a limit, limited membership group, in the Chainsmokers case with Royal, they were 5,000 token holders, 5,000, that's it. So membership has its privileges where they get the ownership in the songs, but the chain smokers also give them, I think, backstage passes to certain things and meet and greets and things like that, that only those members have. It's kind of like the Willy Wonka golden ticket too. I thought that would be kind of fun to throw in there. Um, you know, you got to throw in a little bit of entertainment into it all because NFTs are great for creators. So why NFTs, the benefits, I talked about some of them. But it gives creators like chain smokers the ability to create something entirely new. And it also gives something that NFTs enable. Let's take the ticketing realm. When you're buying a ticket to a stadium event or something like that, you have the risk of counterfeit tickets where you present it and you don't get in, or you have scalping that comes into play. Well, with NFTs, NFT ticketing, and there are a number of companies playing this space. NFTs theoretically can't be replicated and counterfeited. So in the NFT ticketing realm, those issues of scalping and counterfeiting go out the window. That's the beauty. Plus the NFT ticket can tie in other additional benefits on top of that. That's exciting. NFTs improve the transfer of assets because there's no middlemen. It's the, the NFT holder and the, you know, those from whom they bought the NFT, there's a direct link there. And so it's peer to peer. You can just do it directly that way. No middleman takes a cut. It just goes direct that way. So it is theoretically power to the people in that way. NFTs enable continuing economics. So from a creator's standpoint, think about it. I mentioned the artist, the painter who was working with Oud, um, that company that creates physical uh, collectibles together with digital and sold as an NFT. So the creator, you can create the smart contracts that underlie the NFT such that the creator, in this case, that artist, gets paid each time their physical work is resold or their digital work or whatever the IP is gets resold and resold again. So if you're a painter in traditional times, you got paid once. You painted the painting, you sold it to somebody, you get your money. But then the buyer, the art collector, if they resell it, the original painter got nothing. Well, with NFTs, it's not that way. You can create smart contracts, create the rules of the game where the artist continues to collect. And so fostering creativity is a fascinating thing. And that's um, so for supporting the creator economy, NFTs are a great tool. And then new sources of financing for creators. I mentioned chain smokers again. So these fractional um, investors, fans, they're the ones who fi financed that latest music of the chain smokers and then they earn in it. But financing can be for any kind of creative work. So in the realm of movies or television, um, producers, there's so many ideas there to produce video, premium video of some kind. And then you have your traditional sources of capital. 
that means a lot of stories never get told because they can't get that capital. Well, now, uh, if you're a producer, now you can go directly to an audience and through an NFT, raise capital that way to fund your production. And you're giving the opportunity to those fractional financiers, this audience, the ability to actually earn from the production that you created through all of its revenue streams, by the way. And there are companies that are doing that today where uh, you provide an NFT. Let's say there's um, an underserved audience in the marketplace, a specific market segment that the storytelling isn't broad for them. And you think that there's a story that could resonate with that audience. Well, you can go directly to that, that niche audience and tell them about your project. And unlike just crowdfunding, where crowdfunding through a platform, you'll be able to finance a project, but you don't get a share of the earnings on an ongoing basis. Well, an NFT can give you that opportunity. And so from a fan perspective or audience perspective, as I said before, the benefits are that once you become an owner of something, you have, not only do you love the work, presumably, or the artist that you're supporting, but you also are proud to be an owner and you're going to promote that work. You're going to be a marketer for that work. You're going to distribute that work to others because it's in, you're incentivized for economics to get your fractional share the more you grow it. So it's great for everybody in the ecosystem. Here's some of the challenges. Through the blockchain, there is no centralized authority. That makes it difficult if there's a, to hold any individual or organization accountable. That's a big challenge when we're talking about the legal risks and issues associated with NFTs. Now, I wanted to mention just one small thing, a curve a little bit about DAOs, which are decentralized autonomous networks, because you've probably heard of those. There are theoretically member-owned communities with no centralized leadership that pursues some kind of goal. Sometimes it's to buy something. Sometimes it's just to do something. And what's different between that and NFT, NFTs are through centralized sorts of organizations or companies like Royal with the chain smokers opportunity. Well, with DAOs, there is no centralization theoretically, although frequently with DAOs, you still have a couple group members who are super members who set the tone, help to prioritize, but there's a lot of gray with all of that. So it's all evolving. So this is where it gets back to kind of a high level challenge. As I mentioned, things are constantly evolving in this space. There's so much gray. You need to work with smart lawyers and advisors who help you navigate that and create the strategy because of the legal and regulatory frameworks that are always evolving. Not only does it Im implicate federal laws, but state laws, international, as I mentioned. If your NFT touches outside the US, you can't just think about the US. You have to think about all the individual territories. How do you solve that? I'll talk about that a little bit. So here are some of the key legal issues when it comes to the NFC, NFTs. Most or many of them, people think about most of them as being digital assets or virtual assets. But as I mentioned, they're physical, but whatever, they can be physical and they can be hybrid um, in terms of what the asset is and what the experience is. But they're all subject to real world legal realities. And those include ownership, talking about IP copyright rights, contract rights. And I'll talk about those a little bit more. Cybersecurity, privacy issues get implicated, of course. And we'll talk about that. Securities laws, as I mentioned before, highly complex, critical to understand whether securities are implicated, some securities laws are implicated or not with the NFTs that you're working on. Then there's the international that I mentioned. How do you solve this problem of 200 plus territories globally? And then there's taxation, advertising, promotion, gambling, anti-money laundering, and I'm sure a whole host of others. I'm not going to, for the purposes of this webinar, there's no time. I'm not going to get into those last four, but we'll talk about ownership and IP first. And again, if you have questions, which you probably will, then just go into the chat or the Q&A, and at the end of this, I'll answer questions. So buyers of NFTs typically, typically do not purchase the art or IP underlying their NFT. 
It all depends on how the owner or creator defines the rules of the game. They're the ones, whoever creates, gets to set the tone of what it is that you are granting through your NFT. But typically, to date, the creators are the ones who retain the copyright ownership, and which means the exclusive right to copy, distribute, modify, publicly perform, display, and monetize. Again, it's up to the creator, but that's typically, that's the baseline. That means that the NFT, the buyer of the token, gets a license to, for whatever it is that they buy. Not the owner, but they have the owner of the actual NFT, of the NFT itself, but not of the underlying IP. So like on a board ape, yeah, uh, board ape. Although that's a, there's an exclusion there because of the rules of the game that the creators set. But let's just assume that a, an image, like a board ape, um, the creator who creates it, they're the one who own it. So even if you buy the board ape um, NFT, doesn't mean that you have the right to do whatever you want with it, create a movie or something like that about the board ape. It all depends on the rules. It's the, uh, the underlying rights holder is the one who gets to commercialize in all respects. So typically, if you have a license to use, you can do things, but for personal use, not for commercial use. So when, you're a, when you are an NFT creator, it's critical to define what the rules of the game are, what the scope of your license is or the grant of rights that you're giving to the NFT buyer. <clears throat> so your licensing language needs to explicitly lay out what the buyer's rights are and are not. And as the buyer of an NFT, it's critical for you to understand what it is actually that you're buying. This is a critical part of creating these rules, lawyering them. Some of the grants or the rights that you are acquiring are very narrow. Some are very broad. And actually in the Board Ape Yacht Club situation, the right that was given to NFT holders, the rights that they had included a derivative license. So it gave an unlimited right for buyers of the NFT to take the Board Apes and do whatever they wanted with them, essentially to commercialize them. And a small group of Board Ape Yacht um, owners created a spinoff called Cake Apes. And now there's a litigation involving the, that subgroup that created Cake Apes of who owns what with respect to that derivative work. Lots of issues when it comes to understanding what rights you are granting and what, what rights as the NFT buyer is getting. And then of course, when you're creating these um, rules of the game for what it is that the NFT encapsulates, Remember, technology is always evolving. You can't know, you can't anticipate everything that's happening in the future. We have no idea what's going to be created in the future. So it's critical to draft the language in a way that covers future developments of technology now known or, or hereafter, hereafter devised. And I'll talk about some cases that talk about that, but think about that. It's important to really focus on that issue. And then ultimately, here's one risk too when it comes to the who owns what sort of thing. You, to be able to mint an NFT, you need to be the IP owner. So even if you're advertising an, uh, um, or showing the imagery, the IP of a, a specific creative work of any kind, and it's on your platform, you are potentially liable if the rights haven't been granted in the right kind of way. And so it's critical for platforms themselves to really understand what it is that's on their platform and available for sale. So they're not considered to be promoting something that's infringing and things like that. A lot of issues to cover. I'll talk about some of the litigation and where they are today. So this is up-to-date information. The critical piece for all of you out there to understand is that because there's so much gray out there, so few rules of the game, so much just transforming before our eyes when it comes to the, the law and the regulatory um, aspects that implicate NFTs, that the early litigation, the early disputes have outsized effects because they create precedent for others who follow, which is typically the case whenever there's new technology. So it's critical to understand the early cases. You know, Obviously, that's something that I and we do over here at Creative Media and at Creative Legal. 
given the fact that we do those sorts of things. So understanding being up to date on these things is critical. It's guidance for you, essentially. And because there's so much money at stake in the world of NFTs, and because the rules of the game are so uh, great, there's a lot of litigation that's, that's happening in this world. And it's important to follow that litigation where it's going. Litigation is frequently used as a competitive weapon in business. Always has, always will be. It's used very aggressively in the world of NFTs and Web3 in general. Here are some very important cases to understand right now. Miramax versus Quentin Tarantino. This has to do with creators and the rights that they're granting to a studio in this specific case. So Quentin Tarantino announced plans to sell NFTs of digital scans of his original handwritten pages of his screenplay to Pulp Fiction, the cult classic. In his grant of rights to Miramax, when they picked up the film, he granted most things away as is commonly done in a Hollywood deal, but he reserved certain rights. One of the rights that he specifically reserved for himself to retain ownership of was quote unquote screenplay publication. Studio Now, he, he issued his NFTs or announced his plans to issue his NFTs that had to do with the original handwritten pages of his screenplay in NFT format. The studio, Miramax, claimed copyright and trademark infringement because they said that his NFT of the screenplay publication, the digital version of that, of the handwritten, was not did not fall within his reserved rights, the screenplay publication right. They said it did not. And because their contract, when they were granted the rights from Quentin Tarantino, they included the typical Hollywood con uh, uh, contract clause that says, we are acquiring all these rights that are specifically designated. And then such rights that in all media now known or hereafter known, now in all media now or hereafter known, quote unquote, that language which is typically done in these kind of IP studio deals. That's the dispute. So the critical thing is what I mentioned for everybody out there, it's drafting wisely. Whenever there's a grant of rights, whenever there's an acquisition of rights, really being precise in the language and not only knowing what you're acquiring today concretely, but also setting the stage for how technology will evolve. So Miramax and Tarantino is an important case to know. Hermes versus Mason Rothschild. Hermes, the fashion brand, the high-end fashion brand. Obviously, brands like Nike and so many others are getting into the NFT space in a big way. So Mason Rothschild, Rothschild is an artist, and he created a digital Meta Birkin NFT for the metaverse. He, it's a, that's what he called it, Meta Birkin. And I'm not an Aramis guy, but uh, apparently Birkin bags are a big deal and high in fashion and very expensive. So here's the rub. Mason Rothschild did not do a business deal with Aramis to be able to create what he created. He didn't get a grant of rights of any kind. He just did it. He created this digital Meta Birkin for the metaverse. Now think about it. Okay, that seems really strange that he felt he could just do this. But remember that famous Andy Warhol painting with the Campbell soup can? Andy Warhol, just that was his commentary, artistic expression, commentary of the times. He never was granted those rights from Campbell soup. And there was litigation there, but uh, Andy Warhol won that case. Um, I don't know if it actually went to litigation or if it actually went to court or resolved itself, but nonetheless, there was an artistic expression exclusion to infringement in that case, to the claims of infringement. So here, it's interesting. The court in this particular case of Hermes versus Mason Rothschild, they dismissed part of the lawsuit by Hermes because they claimed, because they found that. Uh, the artist had created this or created his meta Birkin as part of artistic relevance. That's what they called it. Interestingly, the court itself said, 
However, if there was a utilitarian use of that uh, digital Meta Birkin uh, handbag, and what they meant by that was if an avatar in the metaverse actually carried that Meta Birkin bag, then the analysis might be different. But they found that there wasn't a utilitarian use in that particular case, that it was just a little virtual project, digital product that was in the metaverse. And so there was no infringement for that reason. Very interesting, fine tuning, kind of like a slice of how they managed to rationalize that. But they also didn't completely dismiss the lawsuit. They also found that Rothschild, or they said that it's very possible that Rothschild was actually trying to trade off the Hermes name. So a different aspect of trademark law, again, highly complex stuff. And so it's critical to work with people, lawyers who understand it, who can guide you when it comes to that. A couple more. So Yuga Labs versus Ryder Rip. This is another closely followed litigation. So Yuga Labs are the ones who created Bored Apes, who I already mentioned earlier today. Ryder Rip is, has been sued by them for infringement because of creating and selling almost exact replicas of the Bored Apes. That's what the lawsuit is about. That Ryder Rip created almost exact replicas of the Bored Apes. But Rip claimed that he was able to do that as a fair use. And I think many of you have heard the terms fair use, but consider that as, a, as an exception to infringement claims. There's a fair use. So, you know, like educational, if you're doing something for school, it could be considered a fair use, perhaps, if you're like photocopying something. So Rip claimed that his was a fair use because it was satire. His, his almost exact uh, replica was satire and protest. And what he meant by that, he is quoted as saying, it was satire and prote protest against the Bored Apes. Quote, to call out a multi-billion dollar company built on racist and neo-Nazi dog whistles via alt-right imagery. That's what he said. That's his comment. So this is going on. This litigation is going on right now. I mean, the point of all of this is that you certainly can't anticipate all the arguments one way or the other in this, in this space of NFTs, but it's important for you to work with and speak with and be advised by those who, who know the latest and greatest. It's important for you to keep up to date with all these litigations that are going on because they are beginning to establish the rules of the game. One other big case was Jay-Z's Rockefeller Records, that's his record label, versus Damon Dash, who was a co-founder of the record label. So Dash had sold an NFT of Jay-Z's first album, Reasonable Doubt, that purportedly would give Dash's share in, those, in that album, sell it to whoever bought the NFT. So acquiring the rights he had into that record as co-owner of the label, and then the earnings that come from that. Well, he was sued for that because the, his claim of being able to sell his share of the IP in that label or in that specific album was something that Jay-Z did not agree with. And so ultimately this case just settled recently and essentially the settlement included um, a conclusion that the individual shareholders, the label did not own, uh, could not, they didn't own a share directly in the in the copyrights to the record itself, to the album itself. Rather, they own a share of the record label, the business of it. So that's an interesting one. So a few more issues to keep in mind. Every NFT, every company really that's operating in the internet has a terms of service, of course, the TOSs with all the fine print you know, of everything. Well, in the NFT space, frequently some of these TOSs say that many that many of, these, um, res many of these terms of service reserve the right to shut down a user user's account or deny access to their NFTs that they bought. But think about that. That conflicts with the concept of ownership. And so that could lead potentially to problems. So think about your TOSs. Royalties, the interoperability problem. So let's say you buy an NFT on a certain platform and then you wanna resell it on another platform. Well, the problem is that you most typically cannot do that. Interoperability between platforms in the NFT space is something that has not been a problem that's been solved yet. And that's a critical piece to be able to really maximize the overall NFT opportunity in the future. So 
the limitations of essentially being able to buy and then if you want to resell, that's going to be limited most typically to a certain platform. So there's limitations there. And then there's data housing and storage problems, all kinds of things. A lot of the time, the entire you know, NFT itself does not reside on the blockchain. Many times it represents, you know, there's the NFT is stored on chain, but the link to the imagery, like the, whether it's the board ape, you know, the actual, the visualization or the sound that ties into the NFT itself that links the two, well, the link itself is frequently just stored and available online, not on blockchain. And so if that link is broken, then what happens to the value of the NFT? What happens? Well, you don't have a centralized authority or service to go to to solve that problem. So that's a real issue too. Because of the limitations on the blockchain and just the amount of data that's held on chain and the expense that goes with it, all these kind of things are, are needed to be solved going forward. And then many of you have heard of the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC. It governs a lot of contracts. Um, essentially the framework across all states for contracts, like kind of the underlying framework. Well, it now appears likely that the UCC is going to create a basic framework for NFT transactions, transactions in Web3 as well. So it's really important to understand developments there because that's going to impact how you define your NFTs. So that's one category, contract and IP. Another major ca category, of course, that's implicated by NFTs are cybersecurity and privacy issues. Personal data. All this personal data, protection for it. Um, well, although the blockchain is theoretically meant to be foolproof and, and hack-proof and all these kinds of things, we're seeing issues that there are, there are holes, there are gaps that, um, you know, there's some use cases or there's some cases out there of a parade of horribles of things where it wasn't that way. Or let's say you use, lose your password to your, your um, your wallet online or your Web3 wallet, what happens then? Well, you don't have a centralized authority to go to. Or what happens if you are hacked? Well, you don't have a centralized authority to go to to be able to address those kind of issues. So privacy issues, once you're in this space, it's something to really think about is that you are beholden to whoever you're doing business with that everything is secure, very secure. So. Like this is a continuing issue that's going to be going on and there'll be lots of liability there ultimately if there's a way somehow to find uh, an authority um, accountable. Now, like one of the major platforms for NFTs is OpenSea. And so it, there is a central platform that makes NFTs available, just kind of presents them to the world. And you can imagine that in the future, there will be litigation that goes after certain platforms that that present, organize the NFTs. Um, so it's all these things keep in mind. Securities issues. This is a major bucket that's implicated by some NFTs, but not all. And securities, obviously securities laws are highly complex. Regulatory framework is highly complex. The potential um, um, impact, adverse impacts and money at stake if things are done wrong Securities laws are, are, are um, there can be tremendous penalties that come with these too. So it's critical to get this right and be as guided in this process as possible by smart lawyers and advisors who are helping you. So so-called utility tokens do not implicate securities laws where there's value, but it's not in a securitized kind of sense. Well, what does that mean? When does it cut? When do, do, does an NFT flow into being a security, which then implicates all these kinds of issues. And that framework needs to be navigated with precision to avoid liability. Well, there's a test out there called the Howey test. That's a very important term to, to know in the NFT space, the Howey test. So the Howey test is implicated, which means securities laws are implicated when there is an investment of money or other type of consideration in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits, reasonable expectation of profits to be derived from the efforts of others. So 
of, as is the case with many things in the law, it's not black and white. It's a case by case analysis that's done about whether the Howey test is what, whether Howey is implicated. And there are several factors that come into play there. And remember, the way the courts are, just because there's a, a factor test doesn't mean that every court is going to reach the same conclusion on whether something is a security or not. That's the case with almost all law. Just because there are certain laws that appear that read a certain way doesn't mean that everybody who reads them is going to interpret them in the same way. So it's critical to work with a lawyer who really understands these things and understands how litigation so far related to those things have come up with a, you know, certain basic rules or expectations that can reasonably be followed to mitigate your risks to the extent possible. So let's go back to a case by case basis, how the Howey test considers things. In the NFT space, NFTs that represent pre-sales of digital assets intended for use on a platform that is not yet built, and the proceeds of the sale are used to build that platform, that most likely satisfies the Howey test, which means it implicates securities laws. Here's another example. There is pooling fractionalization. I talk about fractionalized ownership in the, sake of, uh, in the case of the chain smokers and Royal as an example. There's a pooling of digital assets, which means fractional ownership and shared revenues as they are in the chain smokers case. So in Royal, major firm Latham and Watkins blessed that however they, they implemented that. They um, addressed these securities issues to the satisfaction of the entrepreneurs behind the business such that they took the step to make this offering in the marketplace. NFTs represent a license to a digital asset. That's what I talked about in that particular case and a share of the royalties that came with that. By the way, I think that that whole idea of, of NFTs being used to buy catalogs um, of music, so master recordings or, copy, or, or compositions, I think that's going to be a very big area. And you already see companies like Royal, but there's another company called Opulus, which is doing that. And there are many others who are getting into that space. I think that's a really interesting opportunity. Opulus is O-P-U-L-O-U-S. And they just recently launched, I think it was this past week, they just had a major announcement. So you may want to check that out. And in the security space, here's a cautionary tale, probably the biggest one that people are following. Freel versus Dapper Labs. and Dapper Labs are the ones who created NBA Top Shot moments. Those are the NFTs that were associated with certain clips, video clips of NBA highlights. So Top Shot. I'm sure you've heard about Top Shot and how much trading, and they were really kind of leaders in the whole space of NFTs on mass scale. Well, the question became by some of the buyers, well, these are unregulated securities, right? Because they felt that they were buying into something that would achieve more and more value over time so they could resell it in the marketplace. And so the question became in, the, in this case is, is the NBA top shot, is that a real security? And the Howey test is gonna be applied or, and, and did Dapper Labs then, if it was a security, have the uh, responsibility or the legal need to, treat it as a security when it offered it to the marketplace? Or were the buyers just people who felt like they were guaranteed a win by buying this NBA top shot because others were making so much money on it by reselling it once they bought it, the market kept going up, 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 up. And so they had an expect, many of them had an expectation that they deserve to be able to, you know, get more and more. And then when the market drops, well, their hopes and dreams were dashed. And so was that just buyer beware or was it a security that should have had followed all the different rules of the game for an offering that way? So follow that one. And then on the international front, as I mentioned before, there's 200 plus territories out there. So everything I mentioned, the Howey test, that's US law, that's securities laws here. Contract law is going to be different here. IP laws can be different here than it is in other territories around the world. So how do you navigate things beyond the US? Well, I do that, my firm does that. We work with clients in the Web3 NFT space. And this is the way I would frame it up. 
that nobody can be experts in every territory in the world. So you need to know who, who are experts or who has experience in other territories in the world of Web3 and NFT, and that's critical. And so if you can find somebody who can organize that team effort, essentially, pick the players, pick the team from around the world to help be part of that, to, to identify the rules of the game in specific territories and come together with an efficient, cost-effective strategy, that's what you want to do. So it's critical, whoever your advisors are and lawyers are, no matter whether they're here or around the world, that they understand Web3, just the basic language of NFTs, that they understand it, that it's not new to them. That's really important just so there's a commonality in your discussions about strategy and there's an understanding of the business uh, goals so that real solutions can be figured out. So identifying, this is what you do. If you want to mint an NFT, looking at others who have created the most similar types of NFTs, understand how they went about what they did and both in the US, but in other territories in which you want to play. And the best way to do that is to work with somebody who has that kind of experience to identify those other players in the space. But you want to leverage the learnings of others. Others who were the pioneers had to do certain things. They invested a lot of money to take a path a certain way. Didn't mean they were right, because remember, there's really no right or wrong. They're defining the terms of the game, but they're creating a framework that will get more and more granular over time. So it's important to identify those who have already done what you're trying to do and follow what you believe are the best practices that they've created. Best practices doesn't mean just the way that they executed it. It also means who they used in other territories. And so one of the, you know, one of the things that I can do and we can do over here is that we know what resources, other lawyers, other advisors in other territories, what they used uh, to be able to be successful. So it's easy for us to contact these others and say, okay, who did you use for uh, Brazil? Who did you use as the expert in this territory? So collecting those, leveraging the best practices and the best minds from around the world, that quarterbacking of it all is something that's really important to find whoever that may be. Also, that person, if they're knowledgeable, you know, we feel, and I feel like because of my business background and legal background, I can quarterback these things in a way that really make it more cost effective because otherwise lawyers are just billing, 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 and it gets really pricey. And so when you're talking about an international rollout strategy, it's critical for somebody to, to oversee all of that, to keep everybody in check and be as efficient as possible. So that's a critical way to kind of think about the international strategy. And then before we get into some Q&A, here are some companies that I think are just doing really interesting things. There are many. These are just some that I know particularly well. So Royal, I mentioned. Royal, I think, is um, kind of leading the charge when it comes to the for artists, music artists, to be able to um, bring their music to their fans, fractionalize it, so sell a limited edition NFTs um, to a subset of fans who then get a bundle of rights to those songs and to an overall experience. So like with the Chainsmokers again, there were 5,000 tokens, the latest album. So they become fractionalized owners in that album, which means that they get a fractional share in their earnings, but they also get other benefits that the Chainsmokers gave them, such as things like backstage passes. Open with a three, is a fascinating company backed by highly pedigreed founders and backed by significant investors who are blue chippers. Check them out. Um, open with a three dot world. They've essentially created a, a full on platform for any creator, any creator. That's the goal here. Any creator to be able to create an NFT for themselves and choose the functionality that they want. It could be for audio, it could be for video, it could be creating the overall experience, how to monetize it, all that sort of thing. That's what Open is. It's a big vision, but this is the team that can pull it off. Very interesting company. Fan controlled football. I recently had the CEO on as one of my podcast guests on my Fearless Media podcast. And fan controlled football is fascinating. As soon as I heard about it, I liked it. What this is, is that fan-controlled football combines the real world with the digital NFT. 
So the NFT buyer here buys a share of a real world team that plays on real turf and the owners, the fractionalized owners of a particular team, they play a game in real time against another team by a different set of fractionalized owners. And these fractionalized owners are the ones who are calling the plays, the actual plays in real time and going for a real, real world championship in football. But it's all done by this fractionalized, the, these NFT holders who own, they're part owners of a team and they get to ultimately, once the Howey test securities and all that, ultimately they may be able to share in the earnings of the team itself. So combining real world experiences into a, an NFT, fascinating. Trioscope is another company in the media space. So they're best known probably to date for the Liberator series on Netflix, which is hybrid animation, super stylized, but it's their technology that underlies that. So the Liberator is really just meant to be a showcase for their, um, you know, for their underlying technology. And they are then licensing that technology to other creators to be able to create hybrid animation. Well, Trioscope just recently announced, I think it was in the past week or two weeks, that they have an NFT um, that's related to their movie Takeover or the television series Takeover. And you can read about that, but an NFT that brings in real world experiences into the overall like fan experiences. I'd mentioned a company called Oud uh, earlier, and they're into physical collectibles like art, like, like um, physical records, like physical sports memorabilia but that also combines the digital counterpart to that and can bring in real experiences part of it. But they lead with the physical product that's authenticated on the blockchain so that there is no risk, theoretically, no theoretical risk of fraud or uh, forgery, things like that. They just announced their first drop earlier this week. Check them out. Nice, good pedigreed players behind that one too. Koji is a company that I know and I've known for from the very beginning. Um, they're very innovative. They're doing really interesting things in the creator economy. They're bringing tools for any creator for, to create a LinkedIn profile, profile, LinkedIn, not LinkedIn, LinkedIn that brings in whatever elements of a, a audience fan or a creator fan wants to commercialize, wants to bring to their fans. So it's an easy toolkit for somebody to just kind of say, okay, I want to create an NFT. I want to do this. I want to do that. That's what Koji does. They're worth checking out because they're really interesting. They have blue chippers behind them too, from an investor front. And speaking of investors, I've identified two leading venture capitalists in the world of web three and NFTs, Bitcraft and Galaxy Interactive. These two VCs, um, really are invested in some very cool bleeding edge NFT companies. So I put them here because if you want to check out some other companies that are doing really interesting thing in this space, check out their portfolio companies, go to their websites, and you'll be able to see the companies that they've invested in, in the world of Web3 and NFTs. So some final resources, and then we'll get into some Q&A if you have any. And if you do, then put it um, just click on the Q and a, and then I can answer your questions that way. So my firm, creative media, creative media.biz, we do both legal and the business kind of uniquely, we combine it all. And that's what brings the value that our clients are finding with us is because that we bring solutions, not just identifying problems, but we're a resource because I do a lot of writing as well. And I put a lot of that onto the website and podcast through my fearless media podcast, et cetera. And these are all like my podcast is with leaders in the space of NFTs. So leveraging their thoughts, hearing directly from them, from these innovators, check out my fearless media podcast. It's on all platforms. I think the last 12 episodes have all been about web three and NFTs and it's with leaders in the space. So it's fascinating, including the venture capitalist, fan controlled football, many, Oud, many others, my newsletter, um, I send out a newsletter and I want to ask you, would it be helpful to you for me to create a newsletter of legal updates, specifically a newsletter about legal updates in the NFT space? 
because I couldn't find anything out there on that. And the world of legal is changing so rapidly in the NFT space that having a, um, a resource there, I think could be very helpful. And it's something I follow all the time anyhow. So putting that together would not be difficult, but I only if it's something that's interesting to you. So let me know, drop me a line at peter at creativemedia.biz if that's something that you would find useful. My podcast, I'll, I'll host more webinars. Two podcasts that I think are interesting. Real Vision is something I listen to. It's all about Web3. And then Gary um, V, that's what he's known for colloquially. He's kind of the guru among the crypto set. And so he puts out a lot of content and a very big booster of Web3. Um, but he's a name that you should know and it's worth checking out. And there's my contact information. As I mentioned, my Twitter is at Pete Chatty, C-S-A-T-H-Y. You see my email address. You know a little bit about me. So I see a few questions. Let's see what they are. So Barbara Shapiro says, um, not a question, but good to see you, hear you. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. I appreciate that. Frank Johnson. Uh, I'm interested on the challenges. I'm interested in hearing your insights on the challenges in administration of music IP NFTs, or is this simply a form of syndication of ownership and then the operational administration is outsourced to traditional publishing administrators? So um, a, plat a platform like Royal that I talked about a lot. So it's er in everybody's interests, to grow the value of a catalog when you're an acquirer. And I'm very deep in the acquisition space. Um, I've been involved in the Prince deal, um, buying that, uh, you know, Devo, Air Supply, uh, Boston, uh, Sheila E., um, Wailing Soul, a bunch of great artists. I've been involved in those catalog sales. I, I love that space. I think it's great for artists. I think it's great for buyers. But the whole goal here is for whoever is putting out the money to buy, they want to accelerate the opportunities and earnings for that catalog. So if the baseline for a catalog is like this, where it's kind of slowly, steadily going up, then of course the goal is to bring some real active management to those songs so that it's instead goes up and to the right in a very significant way. And so in the case of, and for Royal and in NFTs, everybody who's a fractional owner is incentivized to grow the opportunities and royalties. So the beautiful thing is that it's kind of like self-activating, Frank, where if I'm a fractional owner in the chain smokers, I'm gonna be psyched. I'm gonna tell my friends about it. I'm gonna promote it across my socials. I'm gonna distribute it far and wide because I'm so happy and psyched to be close to my, my um, artist, my band, um, but not just bragging rights. I also think it's cool to make earnings or royal, a share of royalties and grow my economics of it too. So I'm going to promote it far and wide. That's a new kind of active management. But in terms of administration itself, Royal is not going to be creating the, the actual administration of the rights, like collections. and Well, collections in the blockchain is theoretically automatic and tracking. But Finding syndication or um, uh, sync licenses as an example, or merchandising opportunities. That's what not. That's not what Royal will do. So Royal will most definitely contract that out. So you still have the external marketing resources that are needed to maximize an opportunity, but there are certainly many buyers out there of music catalogs who are just financial players, and they do like bring in a partner to do the actual administration. That's very typically done. Um, and then Frank, thank you. Yes, please do a legal newsletter. Um, I intend to do that. I, I just think that it's really important for people to stay on top of it. So uh, Frank, one last thing. And then um, I think this is the last question. Is it too early for valid data to support the thesis of NFT owners driving increased yields? Too early. I have not seen a study or concrete results from an economic standpoint that shows a case. So Frank, to answer your question, I haven't seen a specific, but this is so new. Like Royals offering with chain smokers is very recent um, because of the securities issues involved that I was talking about. 
So this is all new, but the conceptually, I can't imagine it being other than a positive for everybody involved, for the artist and for the fan who is a part owner, for all the reasons I indicated. Now, there's the emotional um, a return on investment, as well as the economic return on investment. So it's not just a financial thing for most fans to be able to buy in and get a piece of ownership into a song or whatever. There is a big emotional component that we can't, nor would I want to ever uh, minimize. But just if you're looking purely on the economic front, I can't imagine that would be anything but a positive for bringing your fans into something because they're going to be your greatest marketers. They're the ones who are giving you value in the first place by buying your albums, doing all that sort of thing. They're going to tell their friends that they're psyched, that they, you know, that they're part of this, that they own this song, and they're going to promote it far and wide across their socials, which will get other people interested and so on. Now, the interesting thing there is there's some great halo effects, Frank, that come with that. So the artist not only gets the fans to finance their work and be part of the overall enterprise, essentially. And in this case, it was that latest Chainsmokers album. But because their fans now are part owners and, and really marketing the hell out of this, that's going to raise the overall, across all their socials, that's going to raise the profile of this artist, in this case, Chainsmokers, for all of their work. Now, the fans are part owners in that one album, but the artist themselves is going to benefit from the halo effect of all of that marketing from all of these hardcore fans to all of their socials across all their socials, which will elevate the profile, elevate all the work, not just the work from the last album, which means the economics of that are going to be on a grand scale for the artist. So when you think about fostering creativity through NFTs, when you think about the community, the community that's formed from the NFT around the creator, I'm extremely bullish. I, like you, will look for the case studies that demonstrate the real world results. We're very early, but that's uh, my perspective on that. So are there any other questions before I move on? Uh, let's see. I agree. Focus legal newsletter is needed. Thank you, Barbara. Um, thank you, Martin, for your comment there. And Frank, thank you again for your comments. So everybody, hope that was helpful. I will make this available um, on demand. Feel free to share it. Uh, like I said, kind of high level, I get very deeply, I'm fortunately deeply involved with some top players in the world of Web3 and NFTs. It's a space I know and love. Um, and the you know I bring the bi business and the legal aspect of it because I've been a lawyer throughout my career. And I've been a business entrepreneur throughout my career and, um, and always surrounded by great creators. And so it's a space I love uh, and I look forward to helping people on, out figure it all out because there is so much gray and we're the ones, all of us are creating the rules of the game that are going to impact all future NFTs. So it's an exciting time. Thanks for watching. And feel free to reach out at peter at creativemedia.biz.